All right, welcome back to our second lesson over DNA profiling. If you haven't already watched the first lesson, make sure that you go back and do that because it's a review of DNA in general, um, where it's located in the cell and how it's used in forensics. So definitely watch that video if you have not already watched it and then come back to this one where we start to talk about how evidence, DNA can be collected as evidence and then turned into something useful to forensic investigators. So DNA profiling is the most important discovery in forensics to date. Now, why do I say that? Well, because DNA profiling is the actual process of determining an individual's characteristics. And we know that DNA, except for identical twins, DNA is unique to each person. So it all started with Alec Jeffries back in 1984. Um, and he was in his lab working on x-ray and DNA. And what he found was that he could tell a lot about a person just by looking at their genetic profile or their DNA fingerprint. So you can see uh, 1984 is when Alec Jeffries developed the process of DNA fingerprinting or DNA profiling. And then very shortly after, just three years later, the first conviction um, what happened um, based on DNA evidence. And so we've been using it ever since. It is a fairly new technology with regards to time as a whole. It's a fairly new technology, but has been quite instrumental in forensics. So to make it understandable, you need to know that in humans, we have long linear strands of DNA. But within that, we have something called genes. So it is true that 99% of our DNA is going to be exactly the same as every other human on the planet. However, there are segments within our DNA that are unique to us, and these segments are called short tandem repeats, or STRs. And scientists have discovered that there is quite a bit of variability within these STRs. So they are basically letters of DNA that repeat over and over and over. And these STRs differ from person to person. So if they're extracted from the rest of the DNA, then they can generate a profile that's unique to that person. And we call this a DNA profile or a DNA fingerprint. And that's exactly what you're looking at on the screen. So in the bottom right hand corner of the screen, this is a genetic profile or a DNA profile. Um, and then investigators can use that to match crime scene evidence to different suspects. So it is quite a complicated process. I'm going to use this image to kind of walk you through the process because I think it's easier to understand um, if you're looking at a picture. So basically what we're looking at in this picture is a process known as gel electrophoresis. Um, and gel electrophoresis is used by investigators to create a genetic profile or a DNA profile. But it's a little more complicated than just creating a genetic profile because the DNA has to first be collected and then it has to go through some different steps before gel electrophoresis comes into play. So if you'll look at number one in the picture, um, this represents DNA and it's collected. It can be collected from a crumb scene. It can be collected from a person who wants to understand parentage. Maybe if somebody's the, their father or somebody's their mother or somebody's a sibling. Um, it could be collected from somebody that just wants to understand certain predispositions to different genetic diseases like cancers um, or Alzheimer's. So there's a lot of different applications to DNA profiling, but number one just represents the DNA itself. So after the DNA is collected, restriction enzymes are going to be added because they're going to cut the DNA into fragments. And that's important because that's where we separate the STRs. Remember, that's what's unique to each individual person from the rest of the DNA, which is not unique. Um, so once extracted, we have what's called variability. So then we're able to move on to the next step. So if you'll look at step three, after we have used those restriction enzymes to uh, cut the DNA and secure the STRs, 
We can then amplify those STRs by using something called polymerase chain reaction or PCR for short. And then if you'll look in step four, we can then separate um, those STRs by putting them through the process of gel electrophoresis. So the DNA is placed in wells. And if you'll look at um, picture five, you can see those gray rectangles represent wells. So the DNA is placed in those wells within an agrose gel. And then electricity is going to be used to pull those fragments of DNA to generate what we call a profile, a genetic profile or a DNA profile. So the difference between step five and step six is a stain has been used to just sort of make those uh, markers pop so that we can print it out and then compare. So that whole process is called gel electrophoresis. And you might think, how is that applicable? Well, it's applicable because it helps us in forensics to match evidence found at a crime scene to maybe suspects or maybe to a victim, or it might can exclude a victim to, to be in the donor of DNA found at a crime scene. Um, so it can help in forensics. It can also help us determine family relationships. I mentioned that earlier can also help in health care. So I also mentioned that earlier. It can help us understand if we are um, likely to have Alzheimer's or breast cancer. So when lab techs do DNA profiling, they generally use about 13 different sections of DNA, and those sections are going to be highly variable. So it's a good way to ensure that we have accurate matches. However, um, for these pictures that you're going to see in the next couple of slides, you're not going to see 13 different sections of DNA. So you're only going to see a couple. Um, and that just makes it easier to read these D DNA profiles starting off. Um, but just know that in real life, it's a little more complicated than this. There are going to be many more um, different sections of DNA that investigators have to look at. So uh, one application to DNA profiling, of course, is with forensics. So you can see an example of that here. So we have DNA that's collected from a victim. We also have DNA that's collected as evidence from the crime scene. And then it looks like we have three different suspects. So what we can do is we can match the markers um, of the evidence DNA to the victim. And what I can see here is the victim is not the donor of this crime scene DNA, which is helpful to investigators because if they can figure out who is the donor, then they have what, what's called a lead and they can follow up on that lead. So it looks like according to this DNA profile, suspect one is going to be a person of interest for us. Here's an example of how uh, family relationships can use genetic profiling or DNA profiling. So you see we have a child here, and if I am trying to exclude one of these two men as the father of that child, I can use this DNA profile. Remember, 50% of a child's markers are going to match mom, 50% are going to match dad, which is helpful as we're moving through. So you can see this marker here, this first one matches mom. Um, and the second one does not match mom, which means it must match the father of this child. So because alleged father one has the marker that matches, we're going to assume that he is the father of the child. Now, there are some common concerns in forensics using DNA profiling. It is a huge part of forensics, uh, but a couple of things. First of all, the quality of the sample has to be a good quality sample. So that is very important when investigators are working a crime scene that they collect good quality samples of DNA. Of course, with a person or any time you have humans involved with interpretation or collection of evidence, there are different mistakes and inaccuracies. Um, also, DNA profiling is not a fast or cheap method of um, crime scene evidence. 
analysis. And so sometimes the labs are backed up. Sometimes you have to wait a long time for DNA profiles to be developed uh, and they are very expensive. All right, if you want further explanation about DNA profiling, uh, if you'll search YouTube for Amoeba Sisters Gel Electrophoresis, they go into a lot more detail than we did in this lesson. It's a really good way to understand the entire process, and the graphics and images are really good too. So if you just need some more information, you can check out that video.